Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm John Bitson, the Menard Family Director of the Sheila and Robert Challey Institute for Global Innovation and Growth. Welcome to today's event. We're lucky to be joined by Vernon Smith, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics. And uh, I'm honored to be able to talk to Vernon today. And he's going to talk about Adam Smith, who was born 300 years ago, and talk about Adam Smith's theory of society. And so we're all going to learn a lot the relevance that that still has today. And I think a lot of people have, have some familiarity with Adam Smith, but maybe not as much familiarity with, with the theory of moral sentiments, which a lot of what you're talking about today is based on that. Um, and so I'm grateful to Vernon for being here today. Grateful to all of our donors for making this possible. Great to, grateful to all of you for being here. We have a huge crowd. This is awesome. I'm sure we have a big crowd on Zoom as well. And so Vernon L. Smith was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences in 2002 for his groundbreaking work in experimental economics. Dr. Smith has joint appointments with the Argos School of Business and Economics and the Fowler School of Law and he helped create the new Economic Science Institute at Chapman University. Dr. Smith has authored or co-authored more than 375 articles and books on capital theory, finance, natural resource economics, and experimental economics. He has served on numerous editorial and advisory boards and as president of several national economic associations. Previously, he was a faculty member at the University of Arizona, Purdue University, Brown University, the University of Massachusetts, and George Mason University. Dr. Smith is a distinguished fellow of the American Economic Association, an Anderson Consulting Professor of the Year, and the 1995 Adam Smith Award recipient conferred by the Association for Private Enterprise Education. He was elected a member of the National Academy of Sciences in 1995 and received Caltech's Distinguished Alumni Award in 1996. He has served as a consultant on the privatization of electric power in Australia and New Zealand and participated in numerous private and public discussions of energy deregulation in the United States. In 1997, he served as a Blue Ribbon Panel Member for the National Electric Reliability Council. He completed his undergraduate degree in electrical engineering at California Institute of Technology, his master's degree in economics at the University of Kansas, and his PhD at Harvard University. Okay, and that's the short version of his bio. Uh, so I'm very honored to be joined again today by Vernon Smith. You'll have a chance to ask your own questions of Vernon. Um, at the end as well. And so thanks again, Vernon, for being here today. We really appreciate it. Well, John, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here again. Uh, my wife, Candace, over here. Why don't you stand up, Candace? That's my wife, Candace Smith. And, and she and I were here a year ago, very much enjoyed our visit, and we're delighted to be back. So yeah. anyway, thank you for that. Introduction. We're, we're <laughs> delighted to have both of you back. We're excited about our etiquette dinner uh, tomorrow night. Uh, I learned how to eat European style. I remember that. And so uh, we'll see how, how well I remember everything tomorrow night. Um, so uh, one other little known fact is that uh, Vernon Smith started out as a transportation economist uh, at Purdue University. We talked about that. So yes. that mm -hmm. is very interesting to me anyway. Um, so, uh, so why don't we start out talking about uh, Adam Smith's uh, theory of society. And so if we're talking about theory of society, I know that most people are familiar with Adam Smith in some way, but probably a lot of people have not read Adam Smith. And so if you have some familiarity with Adam Smith, but maybe not really deep familiarity with him, you know that there's something about self-interest. And you know, Adam Smith <laughs> talks about self-interest. So how in the world could we have a stable society when everyone is just looking out for themselves? I mean, so it seems, you know, like how could Adam Smith have a good theory of a stable society? Well, uh, John, Adam Smith didn't think about a lot of things the way we do today. And you see, today we think of, well, if people are self-interested, then they act in their self-interest. Well, Smith distinguished between being self-interested and acting self-interestedly. And uh, for example, a, a quote from Smith that kind of illustrates this is a quote that says that 
we humble the arrogance of our self-love in order to bring it down to what other people will go along with. That's the key. You see, we, uh, we're, we're social, and we're social because we interact well with other people. And you don't get along with your neighbor very well if you always act strictly in your self-interest. So we balance uh, our self-interest against the interest of others in order to be able to, to you know, to, to live comfortably uh, with each other. And I, and I think that's the core, that's the basic idea that, that makes the theory of moral sentiments a theory of society. A, a theory of neighborhood, a theory of neighbor, community, and from that a theory a, a, a society because it, it the nations uh, free nations uh, uh, that operate pr primarily on voluntary principles uh, comes right out of Adam Smith's theory of society. <laughs> yeah. So so could you talk a little bit about the process that we go through to to learn the rules that are going to enable us to, to live in a stable society? Yes, uh, and, and Adam Smith, I think, describes that really quite neatly. It's, it's hard to find it any, in any one place, but if you read Adam Smith uh, carefully, uh, his idea is that we, we first learn about other people by uh, and and how they must feel about things by imagining how we felt in the in the circumstances that they're in. So you, so your neighbor gets a raise or a promotion or something like that. You can, and he feels good about it. Well, you can relate to that because you've had a similar experience, and so you've been there, and so. So it's by his idea of changing places, you see, with other people. And we learn that very early in life as children, why we, 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 we pick up on that. And, and then, uh, so that's the first stage. And then at the second stage, we begin to realize that other people are thinking about us in the same way. You see, in, in relating with other people, we realize that, well, uh, th they're changing places with you. And that's why uh, they're able to uh, know something about what you feel. And he has a great term for describing that. He talks about fellow feeling, people having fellow feeling with each other. Now. Today, we use the word empathy. Well, Adam Smith didn't have that word. Empathy is actually a very early 20th century word. It's not a, a, a word that was uh, available to Adam Smith in the 18th century. And in reading him, I'm glad he didn't have it because he, he talks about fellow feeling. And so he kind of describes uh, and, and re really in terms of more elementary language you see the, the essence of, of uh, neighborliness, uh, okay? So that's, that's, I think, the kind of the, the, the key thing. We see at that second stage, we're coming to see ourselves as others see us. Bobby Burns, the Scotch poet, was a younger uh, member of uh, uh, at, at, uh, in Glasgow, that, the community of Glasgow. He was younger than Adam Smith, uh, but in one of his famous poems, he talks about learning to see ourselves as others see us. So that's sort of the, the second stage in that. And then at the third stage, we start to take in, that into account when we choose our own actions. That is, we start to take into account how other people see us, you see. Yeah. 
and, and so it, it, it's, I, I think it's kind of a, it's a beautiful model of human sociability and how it just comes out of our, of our, in a natural way, out of, out of our day-to-day uh, day -day living. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, nice. Uh, and so you, you talk about, um, in that third stage, you, you, uh, you've talked about the fair and impartial spectator. So somebody who you imagine yourselves that there's a third person that's, that's watching this transaction or what's happening. And look at it from the view of that fair and impartial spectator. So could you just talk about the way fair is defined, yes. defined and how it's different maybe than how people think about the word? Yes, word he fair. uses that metaphor of what he calls the fair and impartial spectator to describe this third stage when we start to balance. And, and his use of the word fair is very interesting because the English word fair in the 18th century meant fair play. The opposite of fair was foul, not unfair. And people thought in terms of, of kind of rules and order were, were kind of like the sports metaphor, okay? And, and if you did something bad, it means you violated a rule, okay? And, and I think that's interesting because yeah, fair meant really fair play. Uh, and now that word has changed. You see, now today we uh, it's evolved. Most wor many words do. Well, I mean, let me give you a spectacular example. The word uh, awful in the 18th cent century it was awe filled to be filled with awe. Yeah. It meant just the opposite of, of what awful means today. So some words really change, really, uh, you know, su quite substantially. And the word fair has, it, it now refers to fair outcomes, distributional questions. And, but but in, in Smith's thinking, the distributional issues have nothing to do with uh, 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 what he called uh, justice, but everything to do with, with beneficence. It has to do with, you know, a beneficial, uh, beneficial outcomes. And, uh, and, and it's interesting and I think uh, illuminating to way to think. In, fa in fact, one of the things that I think I have learned to do in studying Adam Smith is to think like he had to realize how he thinks. And it's, it's very different, in many ways different than we think today. But, and that's, but it's also a, a source of, of understanding when you, when you kind of look at things from his perspective and contrast them with, you see, with, with, with today. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, so at 100, the first 100 lucky people here got a copy of of your book, Humanomics, and there's an entire chapter in there that talks about the way that the English language was, was used at the time of, of Adam Smith and how it's different from maybe today. And so it's, it's precisely talking about you have to understand these definitions in order to really read Smith the right way, and I think that's really, really cool. Uh, yeah. um, well, so, yes, and, and, uh, and he was extremely broadly educated and informed well-informed in literature and arts, as you see, as well as, and he studied mathematics at, uh, at Glasgow University. He studied poetry, and he was very interested in poetry for a while. And, and so as part of that process of, of his own maturing, he was trying out these sort of different, different things. And, and, and so it's, uh, in some ways, we're, we're now, I think, today in economics, we're starting to rediscover the, uh, the, the first Adam Smith and bringing into economics more of these, and the, the title of, that Bart and I used for our book was Humanomics, bringing in the, the uh, uh, 
concepts from uh, art and literature to economics. And in Smith's day, there wasn't a clear distinction, you see, between economics and social science and, and, uh, and, and, and the, the sort of the classical uh, 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 literature in English. <clears throat> So, so could you, you mentioned beneficence and justice just briefly. Could you just talk about the important role that those uh, principles play in, in Adam Smith's theory of society? Yes, Adam, Adam Smith, his, out of his model and his way of thinking, he says that there are just two pillars of society, beneficence and justice. Beneficence is entirely about the good things that we do for each other. Justice is about controlling and limiting the hurtful things we do to each other. And, in, in, and, and essentially, out of the concept of justice, Smith develops a theory of, of property. And because what are the hurtful things? What's the most hurtful thing that any human can do to another? It's to kill him. It's murder. And he said, the next most damaging thing is, has to do with theft and robbery. And then, still further along, it's a violation of contract. So, uh, th these are the kinds of hurtful things that humans do for each other, do at, to each other. And so very early in society, uh, people, uh, big, big, uh, these, these hurtful, hurtful things uh, uh, create the emotion of, of resentment. And, 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 and the resentment leads to the desire to punish, the source of the resentment. And he points out that that is so strong that if we bump our head on something, some people will strike at, at, the, at the hurt. <laughs> Unthinkingly or unwittingly, uh, People will strike at inanimate objects because they've, they've hurt them. And, that, and he, he cites that as an example of kind of how, how uh, deep this is in our, in our thinking. So uh, his concept of justice comes out of that because there's a need to control these, these hurtful things. And, and, there's a, and the incentive to control is coming from the, the resentment that people feel. And friends, neighbors, associates, third parties tend to identify with the victim of hurt, <laughs> not with the person that's, uh, you know, does the damage because mo most people are not there, but they, but they can relate to the, to, to, to the victim. So there's, that leads to sort of a consensus uh, out of people's interactions, a consensus that these actions need to be discouraged. And, uh, and that discouragement, at, at least in modern uh, uh, nations where governments tend to be very strong, that leads to uh, forms of punishment for crime, what's called crimes against the public. But what's really <laughs> interesting about that is that Smith points out, because he's, he's, uh, he's very much an evolutionary thinker. He, he looks at origins, he looks at history, and he sees how things develop. develop. And he points out that in the early periods when government was not as strong as it is today, uh, people had a di different approach to, things, to, to hurtful things like murder 
and 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 for example, what if uh, in in a community, if if your son kills my son, and and the officials capture your son, he's brought to me, the head of the family, to decide what's to be done. And it isn't just me, it's also family, but friends and associates may, may be involved in that. And so in these early periods, uh, the, the remedy didn't necessarily involve uh, the uh, capital punishment or the putting down of the murder. No, a, because people thought part of, of making things whole again was to compensate the victim and the family's victim. So that you might work out a deal whereby there would be a, a, a transfer of assets, of land. There might be some work that would be done by the by the uh, family that had that had perpetrated this. So, uh, and I, I think this is very interesting because it was society saw as part of the import part of the of having a remedy for murder was to try to restore the the uh, as well as possible the uh, the uh, feelings of the of the victims so that and, and that early governments early early governments wanted of course to do things the way people would would find acceptable so the early governments tend to go with that mm -hmm. you see. Right. so and in, in fact there was a this was really quite uh, elaborate there was a, a payment it was called a of a, a, a was a payment for uh, someone who in a family who had died a payment to the family uh, there was a vingel room or tent <laughs> in the earliest period where this this procedure was taken place that that evolved and and the size of the payment depended, eventually became dependent upon the status of, of, the, uh, of the person, of the victim, or the family of the victim. So there were different prices. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and of course the early kings, as governments became more uh, concentrated, the early kings picked that up and, and they would levy the king would levy the vingult and the payment. And then gradually they realized, well, wait a minute. The king was hurt too because the king lost a citizen. So the king deserves some of this payment. <laughs> and pretty soon it was a tax and it had nothing to do with the original notion of compensating victims. <laughs> he has a beautiful illustration of, of, the, of the development of a of a tax out of this Vingo. Uh, that's super interesting. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's the concept of justice, and, it, and that shows how to, you know, people don't do bad things because then again there's resentment, and then with resentment comes the punishment. But how do how do our people induced to do good things in society with on, with oh, Adam Smith's well, model? Uh, Here's his proposition. Uh, we call it beneficence proposition, proposition one. Smith says that actions of a beneficent tendency, which are properly motivated, and that means it was intentional. You did this in, out of the goodness of your heart intentionally for someone. Okay, uh, that are in, uh, uh, intentionally motivated. Uh, uh, there's a requirement that that be rewarded out of the, and it comes from the gratitude that the person feels for this, uh, as, as a result of this action. So, in, in other words, someone does, uh, 
you a favor. And you now have, and it's a phrase very common in the English language, you have a debt of gratitude. Not a debt of charity, it's not a debt, of, it's a debt of gratitude. So that's such a powerful thing, you see it's embedded in, in the language, that to return that, uh, that favor. And uh, I have, a, I, I came up with a parable to illustrate this. It's partly based upon information in the neighborhood that I lived in, in Orange, California. And I call it the parable of the trash barrel. And here's the way it goes. Uh, it's Monday morning and you're heading for the office. Well, before you leave, you get your trash barrel out from your backyard and put it out in front curbside because Monday is trash pickup day <laughs> in your neighborhood. Well, in the evening you come home and your, your mind is preoccupied with the thoughts of the day and you forget to bring your trash barrel in. Well, your neighbor, in the late evening, she's out bringing in her trash barrel, and she notices that you didn't bring yours in, so she brings it in for you. So that's Monday. Well, the following weekend, you're out in your backyard, and you're picking avocados off your tree, and you take an extra sack and put a dozen avocados in that one, and you take them over to your neighbor. She's not at home, so you leave them on the doorstep. Nobody's saying anything, but there's all of these actions, you see. And to me, that, something like that illustrates what Adam Smith is talking about. This is the sort of thing go, that goes on in neighborhoods. And, and notice, it's got a lot, a lot of local information. Neighborhoods are rich in local information. People know what the trash day is. And they know also that the neighbor is concerned to pick it up because if you leave your trash barrel out overnight, the, the street sweeper goes, comes through. And if your trash barrel is out there, you may get a citation. You see, there's all this kinds of information that's in the and, and uh, that neighbors know about. And so they help each other. And so it, it's, uh, <clears throat> and it's, you, you see, uh, Adam Smith's proposition on beneficence leads naturally to the notion of reciprocity, where uh, much later he talks about uh, kindness is the parent of kindness. He says, who, who above all should we be beneficent toward? He says, well, those that have been beneficent toward us. So, you see, he's talking about kindness being the parent of kindness, reciprocity coming out of that, and then that creates, helps to create these close-knit uh, societies, neighborhoods. Yeah, awesome. So can you talk a little bit about the, the roots of, or how beneficence and justice have played a role maybe in developing our, our constitution or a free society in oh. general? Well, you see, what's fascinating to me as an American now reading this stuff 300 years later or 250 years later, uh, is that Smith is dis describing the roots of stable society in voluntary actions. People are doing this. Nobody's telling them to do it. They're just, you know, learning to do it. He, he says it starts in earnest when we first have playfellows. And he, f and he says, our playfellows are not as indulgent as our parents when we do something they don't like. <laughs> he says, that's, you see, we're starting to get this external 
influence. That's when he, we, that's when we enter what Smith calls the great school of self-command. And I think the notion of self-command is very important in, in Smith's thinking because the idea is this stuff is coming right from the bottom. And, I, and what you realize is that who wrote the American Constitution? It was, it was immigrants. <laughs> And they're coming from Scotland and Ireland and England. They're, they're, they're coming from, and some of them are Scotch. The, Scot, the Scotch highlands, I understand, were emptied. People moved out. Uh, for one thing, they were being persecuted by the English. So they came to America and Canada, you see. They're part of that, that Western uh, migration. So, uh, the ideas that made America were coming from the ideas people had that moved to America. You see, it wasn't just uh, some kind of an academic exercise where people are learning what other people think and what they do. It was coming with the people, see, so that in a, you see, Adam Smith's counterpart in America would have been Ben Franklin. I think of Ben Franklin, you see, as kind of a, as a great example of an American uh, patriot uh, and, and who knew about Adam Smith. In fact, when Ben Franklin was in London visiting there for for a considerable period of time, he went up and, and met with Adam Smith. In fact, there's reason to believe that he probably attended one of the Thursday night uh, meetings in, one, in, the, in, the, in a local pub that uh, some of these guys were, uh, they, they, would give, uh, they would give papers, they'd give seminars. And so th there was a, a community. So it wasn't just Adam Smith. Adam Smith was involved with David Hume and Adam Ferguson and other, uh, and his, his, one of his uh, colleagues at Glasgow University was Joseph uh, Black. Well, Joseph Black did the, the first experiments showing that air has, must consist of multiple uh, substances because uh, you could burn what was later real, people called oxygen. You could burn it out of the air, and the air weigh, it weighed less. <laughs> so uh, he did some of those early experiments, and so Joseph uh, Black would have been part of that, and also uh, Hutton, uh, David Hutton, who was a geologist and studied the uh, e erosion on the cliffs around uh, at the Scottish seacoast. And, and had this idea that there was evidence there of, of changes in the earth mm. over time. So the, hot, the idea of erosional geology, you see, was coming out of that, uh, that ferment of the, the uh, uh, Scottish uh, intellectual revolution. And, and, and it's interesting, so they got together. But anyway, there's some evidence of Ben Franklin uh, uh, actually attended that because he was there at that time. And so the, it, it was a very, it was a, it, it, you realize after a while, it, see, it isn't just Adam Smith, there was a community there. And Smith was an important part of it because, for, for, he, for example, he had his, he had Sunday night suppers and he had these people in for supper. And, and, and so the conversation, the debates, and so forth would, would, would continue into, uh, uh, on Sundays every week. Uh, 
So anyway, it's a it's a it's a great uh, uh, book, I think, the theory of moral sentiments. He, he uh, I read uh, the Wealth of Nations as a graduate student. Uh, I got a master's degree, as you mentioned, at the University of Kansas, and well, I often think feel that I got my I had a Harvard PhD, but got my education at Kansas. And the reason is that I had, uh, Richard Halley there was a, uh, an economic thought scholar and, and published on kind of the, the neoclassical economic uh, marginal utility and, and the development of all of that in the, in the 1870s. Uh, so early on, I got, had an interest in, uh, in the development of economic thought, and, and his course was a two-semester course, and most of the first semester was just was reading the, the Wealth of Nations. Awesome. But I never had any idea that he had written The Theory of Moral Sentiments. You know, read The Wealth of Nations, and he never cites himself. It wasn't good form in those days. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to learn this. Uh, and, and actually, you see, his first published book was A Theory of Moral Sentiments in 1759. And then 17 years later, he published The Wealth of Nations in 1776. And, and, and one, of, one of the things I, reasons I think that the theory of moral sentiments became much less well known was that the second book was so spectacularly successful. You know, it was read by, <coughs> uh, that book was read by statesmen, uh, parliamentarians, all kinds of le leaders in the, in the, in the West had, uh, and, and American, uh, the, uh, the, Founders, our own founders, would have been people who had read The Wealth of Nations because it was very much uh, a very popular book uh, at that time and, of course, published in the year of our revolution. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and, of course, Smith would have been attractive to our founders because he was very sympathetic to the American colonial cause. He also believed that, uh, that we shouldn't be, he, he thought that the colonies should help support the cost of their defense and uh, domestic programs of various sorts, uh, but that they ought to be, have a part in, in that decision making. And, and, uh, and, and, of course, he thought the same thing for Scotland and Ireland and these, these uh, other parts that yet have not been fully integrated into the United uh, Kingdom. So he, he would have been a, a, a kind of a, seen as kind of a patron saint uh, of, of, of this this early development, although there isn't any question but what he was a loyal uh, British citizen. <clears throat> yeah. So, so the the book, if you if you didn't get a copy of it, you should buy a copy of Humanomics because you do a, an excellent uh, you know demonstration of all these concepts that we're talking about, and and you you make the very important point that you know you really. A lot of people misunderstand the wealth of nations because they don't they haven't read the theory of moral sentiments and so I think it's you're doing a good service by bringing yes. out this work and, and and then you know all the work with um, experimental economics all the unexplained things that that really were explained a lot earlier by by yeah. Adam Smith and super interesting. yeah you see in fact uh, let me pick up on that one of the famous quotations in the wealth of nations uh, Smith says that uh, every person, and I'm using the modern term, he said every man, but today we would say every person, 
so long as he does not violate the laws of justice, ought to be perfectly free to pursue his own interests in his own way. Now notice, he's not, <laughs> we pursue our own interest in our own way. I think if you haven't read the theory of moral sentiments, you sort of assume, oh well, we're self-interested. That was kind of the, that's not what he meant at all. That's why he's using this peculiar language. We pursue our own interest in our own way because he saw people as defining their own interest broadly because they want to get along with their neighbors. <laughs> and, he, and, and we have different ways of doing that, so we do it in our own way. That is, people are not necessarily always doing the same thing, although there's certain principles that are probably underlying uh, all of it. So it's, uh, it was his first published book, and incidentally, his biographers all point out that he thought it was mo his most important book. He thought it was more important uh, than the wealth of nations. And I think he was right. Mm. He, really, he really needed to speak and develop a theory of society before he could say very much about economy because that's, that's a kind of a, a piece of it, an important piece of it, of course, but it, uh, it sets it in, in a broader context which has to do with the, the principles of freedom, of voluntary action, generally in, in, in our uh, social, political, and legal affairs. And then he writes about how it applies in economic affairs in the wealth of nations. <clears throat> yeah, awesome. Um, yeah, so, so I, you're working on, I was wondering if you could maybe tell us about, I know that you're, last night you mentioned that you're working on a new project, and you could, I mean, I'm gonna title it for you, um, read Adam Smith in a year, maybe. I don't know, but anyway, but this that, is, That's sort of it, yes. yes I, so, yeah, okay, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, I've, I've kind of, I've learned so much by reading The Theory of Moral Sentiments, and it's not an easy book to enter because it's 18th century English, which, and the style and form is, is kind of uh, unfamiliar, but the propositions in it, are, they're just as viable today as they were when he was writing. And, and, I, and I, when, you know, Bart Wilson and I, w we discovered that a lot of these two-person games that were, that were very common in behavioral economics and that people didn't have any theory as to why it, it was working that way, Adam Smith had it. <laughs> we discovered there's propositions in Adam Smith that, that apply exactly to that. Uh, so that was an uh, eye-opener that Bart and I together discovered and then uh, I've, I've sort of gone back and to uh, revisit and reread and all of, of the theory of moral sentiments. And I'm now doing, I've got this idea, and, 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 and how can I get people to read the theory of moral sentiments? Why not uh, have 366 readings in which I give comments on it? There's one for every day of the year including leap year. So maybe this is a way in which it can be made, you can bite off pieces <laughs> daily. <laughs> yeah. and, and then I, uh, I, I sometimes have a short comment on it and sometimes my comment on the quotation is longer than the quotation. <laughs> and for example, uh, a theme very prominent in psychology today that comes from my, the co-winner of the Nobel Prize in 2002, my friend Danny Kahneman, is fast versus slow thinking. Smith's got something in there. He has, <laughs> and I, I didn't pick up on it at first. I realized 
This is about fast versus slow thinking. It's, it's um, actions where we're following rules versus actions where we are, are basically they're motivated by utilitarian consideration. Something we're buying in our, or, or doing in our strict self-interest uh, versus this other. And Smith points out that the things that we do that involve rule falling are very, we do that automatically. We don't have to hardly think about it. You just, you see in, in the parable of the trash barrel, why doesn't the neighbor come and tell you, hey, you left your trash barrel out? No, it just doesn't. <laughs> You see, so, uh, and, and that's, you see, that's what is behind this notion of fellow feeling, you see. So, uh, anyway, I, th I think that's my idea is that <clears throat> have a reading uh, daily so that, uh, and we're, I think I'll, uh, well, I'll use a title like uh, The Wisdom of Adam Smith Day by Day. Yeah. Something, well, something yeah, you're like doing a great service because I so, think a lot of people see, you know, the works of Adam Smith as being inaccessible, you know, huge, they're huge, and you know, if people are like, oh, I don't want to tackle this, that might be a really good way for people to tackle it. And you get a, you can get your book done in a year if you write one page every day, too, so it gives you a yeah. goal that way. So. It will, it'll be mostly about from the theory of moral sentiments, but I also want to do, there, there's some key things in the Wealth of Nations that, illustrate Smith's way of thinking and his whole approach to things. And, I, and so I'm going to use some of those readings. And also from his lectures on jurisprudence. Because that's where he, for example, he develops this idea that early societies were oriented toward compensating the victim, not just punishing the perpetrator. In fact, the punishment was to compensate. So, so he links those together. <clears throat> yeah, so, so that made me think of last night, you mentioned that every time you read Adam Smith, you, it seems like you learn something new. And like, how many times have you read, I'm just curious, like the theory of moral sentiments? And, and, then, and is there something you've it's, learned like, <laughs> recently, like when you've, re you've read? You know, I have no idea, and it's usually not going back and rereading the whole thing, at all. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's reading parts here and there. And some of those I've probably revis revisited a dozen times. I mean, sections and areas where I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going back. And, and it's often subtle. And, and people sometimes get it wrong in reading him because he's making, he's describing a, a situation or kind of what is commonly thought about something. And then, and then he criticizes that. So, he's, that, so you, you've got to be careful. He's not describing his view sometimes. And, oh, yeah. and <clears throat> because he's turning around and he's, and he's objecting to it. So uh, there's, there's a number of examples where, and in fact, it's in the literature where people have, 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 have commented on Adam Smith and got it wrong because they weren't, <laughs> they weren't going far enough. <laughs> I think that's interesting. Uh, so I have one more Adam Smith question, then I'll ask you a few other yeah. questions. But so the, the last question about Adam Smith is, in 2008, I know in Scotland that his statue was Un unveiled and on July 4th, I think it was uh, in 2008. Oh yes, and, and, yeah, 2008. and so and you were the one who unveiled the statue. So how did how did you get to be the person that that unveiled the statue? Of, well, of Adam Smith? Uh, it's interesting. Uh, this was sponsored. I think it's uh, what is now called the Adam Smith Institute in. Uh, in uh, Edinburgh, and the, the person who uh, th this statue had been been designed. It was quite some period being designed and built, 
and was going to be installed on a, on, on a square on High Street in Edinburgh, which is just up the street from David Hume. There's, oh. a, there's a statue of David Hume. So Adam Smith has looked, his friend David Hume is just down the street. Uh, but uh, so they first asked the queen. Well, she declined. And so, uh, and then he asked me. And, and of course, can you imagine what it's like for an American to be asked to unveil the statue of Adam Smith on the 4th of July? <laughs> you see, and, and of course, I have I have ancestors. I had a chessman ancestor who got to America by jumping ship in Boston Harbor and swimming to Braintree. Huh. Oh. <laughs> and uh, he hid out on a farm. The, the farmer hid him because the, the, the redcoats were looking for him. Huh. And uh, so he ended up marrying the daughter of that farmer. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that was a Chessman ancestor. And then I had a Lomax ancestor. The first one was William Lomax. And he was born in uh, England in 1757. And then came to America. And he fought in the Revolutionary War. And I found his name, the land records, all of our land records in the United States have been digitalized. So if you've got an ancestor you think owned land somewhere, you can look him up. Well, I knew that the Lomaxes, my mother was, a, you see, a Lomax. She was born in southern Indiana. And that was a Quaker community that had been settled by people coming from North Carolina. So I looked up the land records in North Carolina. Sure enough, there's, here's this William Lomax. Got 274 acres for fighting in the American Revolution. Huh. Huh. So here I am, 4th of July. This America is, <laughs> is unveiling the statue of Adam Smith. Well, that's a great story. <laughs> So, so I have a, a question, and it's like, just about uh, we've all heard the um, stories of people souring on capitalism. I mean, the, the system that has uh, you know, lifted more people out of poverty than any other system that's existed, you know, in the world, and uh, people are souring on capitalism. But there's also people that are there's a narrative where people are skeptical of profits and so why do you think is there some misunderstanding well, do you yeah, think that people have a, people really don't there's a fundamental misunderstanding about profits because what does it mean to profit it's it, it means your revenue is above your cost every household would like to see more money coming in than is going out. Okay? Yeah. Everybody wants to profit in the sense that you don't, if there's, if there's less money coming in than is going out, you're just going to go to the bottom. Okay? And what does the money coming in mean? Why is it coming in? It's because you're providing stuff for other people. Don't, don't think of the money flow. Think of the goods that are going the other way or the labor. So when you have lots of money coming in, it's because you are providing things of value to other people. And the money is simply measuring, you see, the value of what you're contributing to other people. And your cost tells you how much you're taking away from others <laughs> in order to produce that, you see. So you are incurring a cost for the things that you need in order to produce whatever it is you're making. 
Well, that means you're taking it away from others. Well, you want everybody, you hope everybody on balance <laughs> will have more coming in than going out because that there means they're doing more for others than they're taking from others. You, you see, this is, see, Smith in a way wrote the, the Wealth of Nations because people didn't, they thought, the mercantilists believed the wealth was in the money that was coming in. And therefore, was, you, you needed to export more than you import. He said, no, it's not about the money. Wealth is coming from people who produce goods and services. That's the wealth. And that's flowing in the opposite direction from the money. So it's, it's a simple arithmetic that you want more coming in and going out. And the, mean, and the reason why that's important is that you are doing more for others than you're taking from them. So when you see, when you think about it that way, all of a sudden you see the, 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 these economic principles, I think, make, are, are just common sense. Yeah. And, and, it, and it, I think it's important for it to begin with an understanding of what profit means. Yeah, so those transactions that are not zero sum, I mean, we're, we're growing exactly, the size of yeah. the pie. Yes, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, excellent. Um, so I, to give a chance for people to ask questions from the audience, I, I have one question I want to ask you before I turn it over to the audience. And so um, we have a lot of students here, and so when we bring in distinguished speakers like you, who have a lot of experience and knowledge, do you, do you have advice for, for students that on what they can do to be successful in their lives, just, just general pieces of advice. Don't be afraid of, to follow your interests. That is, you, you read things, um, you have exercises that you do in classes. Think about how those apply to your life and your circumstances that are different than maybe uh, those governing the classroom, but that you can find. Uh, you know, I, I got, I was at Caltech senior year. I'd been studying math, physics, engineering, and I took a course in economics <laughs> my senior year, and I had no idea that anything like that existed. I got fascinated by economics late in my, in my uh, undergraduate career, and, and then I thought, well, maybe I, I'll, I'll Maybe I, I, if I study further, I'll get interested in economics. So I decided to get a master's degree, go back to Kansas and, and go to the university there and get a master's degree, and then from that decide kind of whether I wanted to stay in economics. Well, I did, and I did stay in economics. <laughs> awesome. So did, you must have had a good a good teacher in your first uh, Oh yeah, class. yes, yes. It was the University of Kansas was a great experience for me. Awesome. Okay. So do we have questions from people in the audience? So there's a mic runner and so yeah. Hello, uh, you said uh, you have a lot of uh, research interests uh, such as uh, environmental economics uh, and uh, transportation economics, and now you are interested in Adam Smith. So how do you uh, balance uh, so much research interests? Uh, because our time is uh, limited, and uh, I'm a graduate student, I often confuse that uh, if I want to do research on uh, one research question, I need to read a lot of, of materials, uh, how, so my question is how can you balance your time to do a lot of uh, research things? Thanks. Well, I'm not sure I understand the... So you're, but, you've, you've done, yeah, so how do you balance, you, you have interest originally in transportation economics and then experimental economics and now oh. Adam Smith and like how do you balance like doing so many research things at once? Well, it's, it's part of, uh, you know, following up on my interest at the time. You see, I got, uh, 
my, my first appointment after I finished at Harvard was at Purdue University. And I was associated with a, a, a consulting group there, and one of our first consulting projects was with the St. Louis San Francisco Railroad. And that uh, railroad, it was, home office was in St. Louis, Missouri, and their railroad line connected uh, St. Louis with Dallas and Kansas City with, I think it was New Orleans or, or maybe in Alabama. It was in the south somewhere, so it was an X. <laughs> that was their, and, and they had a lot of kinds of problems and issues that they thought it might be interesting to discuss with our group. And that's got what got me interested in transportation economics because one of their, at the time, what they were trying uh, to decide is whether and how, if they did, go into what was called piggybacking. In those days, uh, you when you, if you took a a, a semi trailer, normally pulled over the highway by a truck tractor, if you set that on a flat car, you could trans you could transport it by rail, and then you had only to deliver it on the front end and pick it up at the other end. So the question was what are the economies in this and should the railroads get involved? Should this railroad be, get involved in it? And so we, we, we studied that. Um, and we, f we figured out that <clears throat> for halls that were more than 200 year, or 200 miles, it was potentially profitable. And there was a gain from, to both the uh, uh, trucking and uh, railroad if the truck, uh, if the semi-trailer was transported by rail. And not too long after that, people were talking about fishy back. That meant going by ocean. <laughs> and so, the, uh, so I wrote the report, final report on that. And I think that what, what I sent you was that report. Uh, and I, I wrote that in, let me see, I think it was about August of 1957. So that's what, about 65 years ago, something like that. And the uh, Frisco, as we called it, railroad ended up they decided that they had a wholly owned trucking subsidiary and they decided to begin uh, piggybacking with their own, their own uh, 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 semi-trailers. And, <clears throat> and that, and of course, that ended up taking off. That became a major, you see, and t today, so if I'm driving out on a highway and as a train passes, and I count 120 cars, all of them with, with trailers on them, yeah. it's an entire train yeah. uh, th that's heading for you know, heading for heading east or west. <clears throat> so that's that's a development that gradually came out of that, and and of course it's worldwide these. Uh, semi-trailers are now go uh, across ocean and then r railroad and fi uh, to final delivery points. And we have whole uh, entire ships just loaded with nothing. That, they look like buildings when yeah. you see them. <laughs> uh, they look like s buildings, just stacks of those. <clears throat> but, <clears throat> but anyway, it was fun kind of being at the beginning of that. Yeah, and then you've just kind of switched to what, but, what are your areas of interest Yeah, and time. then, so I did that, and then later, uh, yes, and, and then uh, my first experiment, that 
also came at, at Purdue because essentially that was motivated by my uh, teaching undergraduates because I, I realized I really didn't know anything between supply and how do, how do you relate supply and demand theory to what people actually do in markets on the ground? Well, we didn't know anything about that in those days. What we had, we had theories and we had ideas about it that you all learned in those days. And, and so we believed that for supply and demand to work, People had to have complete information. Everybody would have to know supply and that. That was actually one of the things that we thought you had to know. And you had to have a very large number of buyers and sellers, otherwise people could manipulate price and it wouldn't be competitive. We had those ideas. So I decided uh, my second semester at Purdue, I would start off and just do a simple experiment uh, in which I'd, I'd take half the class and give them values and, and the other half and give them costs. And the, the, the people with values were buyers. And they make money by buying below their value. And the sellers make money by selling above their costs. And of course, each person only knows their own value or their own cost. So there wasn't complete information. So I didn't think it would work. And, but I did allow for the possibility of learning, so I repeated it. I'd, there'd be a period of trading, and then the market would end, and then then we'd have a new day and people would have the re their values replenished or their costs replenished and then they could trade again so there was an opportunity to learn. Well to my amazement, these sophomores that didn't know any economics found the equilibrium in just three iterations. <laughs> and I thought there must be something wrong with this experiment, but there wasn't. I, I did more of these and it didn't make any difference what the configurations of supply and demand were or they could, they could find it. And, this, and they did it by open outcry. You see a two-sided uh, auction outcome. And, and people, were, people that were doing that had no practice doing that. They were doing it for the first time. And what's interesting is how quickly people fill up catch up on that right away. People, it comes natural to people to trade that way. And, uh, and, and so I gradually uh, disabused me of almost everything I'd been taught. That's quite an, that's quite a, an experience to go through. And then you ask, what else have I been taught that's not true? <laughs> So once you, you see, once you get that idea, then you start a, you're taking a different perspective on learning. You see, the, what you're being taught is kind of the state of learning at the time, and it's what people have come up with. And you've got to ask yourself, well, you know, is there anything I can do to, to better understand that, to contribute that by maybe some different, different methodology? So that's what led to my uh, doing those experiments. Other people thought there must be something wrong with the experiments I was doing too, so they did them, and they found there was nothing wrong with them. <laughs> and so pretty soon it became, you see, uh, uh, something a lot of people were doing, because you could actually, if you thought you knew something, you could test it, you see. So if you're so smart, let's see if you can figure out, uh, predict what's going to happen here, you see, and you can do that exercise yourself. And uh, so that, that made, I think, experiments very attractive to a lot of people because it was a, it was a different way of learning than was uh, prevalent at the time. <clears throat> awesome.
Do you have other? Uh, Professor Smith, thank you very much for coming to NDSU and for thanking to, and for coming to Fargo. Uh, my question is that, so I grew up overseas and I moved to the United States in 2014. And my schooling m made me uh, arrive to some of the conclusions that uh, there's a, an income inequality that's associated with capitalism. However, as I, when I moved to the United States and I started studying economics more in business, um, I realized I, you're, you're the Adam Smith quote sort of resonated with me where every man is uh, free to pursue their own interest in their own way. That brings me back to the Austrian school of economics where you have uh, the, the, study, the study of agents for, uh, and to improve their condition. And so my question is that, do you think that a, uh, the income inequality statement is accurate? Or as I have come to think, perhaps there's an effort in equality. And I just wanted your, your, your thoughts on that. Thank you. Oh, sure. Uh, well, uh, <clears throat> yes, one, oh, see, one thing that make, can make you concerned about equality is that we're, uh, you know, generation after generation, uh, free societies have become very rich and are much richer than uh, societies that are not free. And of course, there's really spectacular examples of this out there in the world, like North and South Korea. They have the same language and history and background, and, and South Korea is wallowing in prosperity. <laughs> And North Korea, Korea is wallowing in misery. Uh, and that's just, that's a very dramatic example, you see, of, of what being free means. And, and it means being free in everything, in all of your actions and all your decision making, economics as well as uh, social and political. And that message is right, articulated very, at a very fundamental level uh, by uh, Adam Smith. And I think we should be concerned about the plight of the poor. Adam Smith spoke of it. Uh, and I think the lessons of economics tell us that the best way to help the poor, poor, is for them to help themselves. Help the poor, help themselves. We need to find better and more effective ways of enabling the poor to contribute more of what they, of their skills, develop their skills so they can contribute more to society. Because if they contribute more, they will make more. And also, I think there's, uh, there are all kinds of self-satisfactions that come with that, feeling that you're part and that you're, you're, you're doing your part. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, it doesn't mean there's no place for welfare, uh, but I think that uh, I would like to see welfare uh, find better, try to find better and better ways to uh, enable people to contribute more and therefore uh, earn more in, in our society. Another question here. Up in front here. Thank you. Um, given that <clears throat> Smith's model can explain aspects of choice that our traditional models can't, or at least don't, in the lab. Do you think it's possible to quantify his model and combine it with our traditional approaches, or do we fundamentally have to choose between a philosophical approach and a quantitative one? Oh, no, I think there's a lot more can be done to the application of mathematical techniques to all of the sort of things that Smith's 
talking about. Uh, because they're, they're about improvement, they're about, about betterment, they're about expanding the, the, the space of, of betterment. And I think this, uh, this has got, we, we, we made, Bart and I tried to get a little of that started in our humanomics uh, book, but I think there's a lot more. And then I have um, uh, a, a new book on economics of markets with Sabayu Inouye, a co-author that uh, I discovered about four years ago. <laughs> And, and he's incredible. He, uh, Sabu is a, truly a great economist. <laughs> and he comes from the former French colony of Niger. He wrote me about four years ago and he said, I think you might be interested in the attached manuscript. He said, what you did in your experiments was essentially to rediscover classical economics. And I thought, wow, I wouldn't have put it that way. So I read his paper. He's right. In a way, the experiments we're doing, you can think of, you can think of them as coming out of chapter seven of the Wealth of Nations. I never, I, that's where they didn't come from, or if they did, it was so deep in my subconscious that I didn't know it. But uh, in chapter seven of The Wealth of Nations, Smith model is thinking about price formation in markets from the perspective of buyers and sellers. And he's thinking of buyers coming to market with a maximum willingness to pay, a, what he called a reservation price. A reservation value actually is what it is. They're coming with a reservation value, meaning that's the most. But if they, but they're trying to buy cheap, <laughs> and then sellers are coming with a reservation cost, and they're trying to sell high. Well, th that's exactly what I was doing in those experiments, and and. Smith says that if sellers bring too little to market, uh, plenty of buyers, more buyers than sellers, are prepared to pay the costs of the sellers. Prices and the price tends to rise. Okay. And I, I mean, sorry, if, that, if, if they bring too little. If they bring too little, if they bring too much to market, then the price tends to fall. So he's he's got a statement there. It's a dynamic statement, you see. So the if price starts out too low, it tends to rise. If it starts out too high, it tends to fall. There's a dynamics. He he's not. He mentions what happens if it could be just right, but you get the impression he doesn't believe that it's ever just right, that, that it's uh, because he's thinking of a world where things may continue, may be changing. At the same time, you're trying to find uh, some balance between what buyers want and what sellers want. So there's really, uh, in revisiting the wealth of nations, uh, again, he's thinking very fundamentally about the agents and economics. Just like in the theory of moral sentiments, he's thinking very fundamentally about the actors in our social social world. And, and, and you realize why this book is so important, three, 200 and some odd years after they've been published, that he's, He's really talking about issues for all time. They're so fundamental that they're as important today to us as they were when he was writing. And because they're just completely general, uh, general principles. Uh, he, he refers them to general rules. He doesn't talk about abstract rules. 
uh, Hayek uses the term uses the term abstract that Smith doesn't. I think he 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 thinks of of rules as general. You see, so that actions of a beneficent tendency that's that's X that are properly motivated. That's why uh, uh, require reward because of gratitude. That's Z. So D, Z depends upon X and Y. You, you see, I think no, I think these can be can be captured in those in, in that framework. <clears throat> No, you don't have to give it up. You, you just, we, we have to kind of think outside maybe of no, the normal box to see how we might make it work. But, uh, you know, a Adam Smith almost studied mathematics. He went, he left, when he went to Glasgow, left Glasgow uh, uh, when he was 17 to enter uh, Oxford. Uh, to study, it turned out to be kind of a, a pretty barren time at Oxford. He later r r writes about that in The Wealth of Nations. He said, he said they have too easy a life, they're getting fixed stipends regardless of what they do. <laughs> and so, and, and of course that that was a problem, and, and kind of academia now has ways of trying to deal with that, let's see, in terms of rewards and promotions and that sort of thing, as to, 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 to incentivize um, we, we professors to, to do our work <laughs> and to do it well. So, um, uh, so yes, it's... Uh, it's, uh, and, and you know, and as you said, John, my project now is to try to find a way of get people to read it, and that's my next book. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Did we have a question there? Um, I was interested in, in the things you were saying about trust and trustworthiness uh, for the, among actions, among people, transactions between people, and so on. But, um, now in today's world, we see a tremendous rise in, in the use of uh, artificial intelligence, machines basically uh, playing a, a, a much more prominent role in these kinds of um, actions and these dealings uh, that go on in the business world and, well, in many aspects of life. Um, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about um, the concepts of trust and trustworthiness in 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 dealings when uh, when we have this increase in in the, in the use of machines and and artificial intelligence playing a, a role these days. Well, I think most of that will be confined, though, to technical technological. Uh, issues that we now uh, have computer science and algorithms to deal with. There's the, the question is whether it, how much it will be able to substitute for things that we think of as more creative than humans. And I'm, you know, I don't know the answer to that. I think it is a, it's a new world in that sense. And young people are just gonna have to do their best to find out the meaning of that world for, the, for their lives. Uh, you know, that, that's, <clears throat> It's, uh, it's not new in the sense that these challenges are, have, have uh, been important in the 
human scene from almost the beginning. Uh, but this has this impersonal aspect of it that uh, people are, make, uh, makes people a little bit nervous. <laughs> so, well, I'm not going to make a contribution to that problem, but young people uh, will be making a contribution to that, that development and, and working out what it means for, uh, for what it means in the sense of purpose to, to life. You know, very immoral sentiments, there's a place where he says, he mentions, what's the purpose of all of this stuff? He says, it's our happiness. Betterment means happier. So he saw uh, the uh, ultimate uh, basis for life as, as something much beyond all the trinkets, <laughs> uh, the devices and the things that, that he saw as, as preoccupying people even in, in his day. Uh, the, 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 you know, the, the, the pursuit of things, the, the pursuit of riches, the pr pursuit of, of reputation, in, in matters that seem very important to people because the way you got ahead, but in the end, what, uh, how much better off are you are in terms of your feeling about having lived in this world. And <clears throat> so that's, I think that's always, uh, something that we all have to live with and, and confront us in our lives. And, and that part, you see, is kind of independent of all of these, techni these technological changes. <clears throat> it, 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 these things may give us more things. <laughs> Think of it that way, we got more things in our lives. Uh, and, but also more knowledge. You see, they expand. I always thought of that economic, that theory, our, our abstract reasoning, uh, kind of involve us in a, a, a higher dimensional space of thinking than we actually live in. I use the analogy of, you know, the uh, shadows on a cave wall. We, we, we to live in the world of the shadows, but we're capable of thinking outside the world of shadows and imagine what might be casting the shadows. And that's the sort of thing that we do when we, we do theory and when we do abstract, when we do mathematics, for example. We're, we're, I, I like to think of it as higher dimensional, thinking at a higher dimensional. Than, than the one that we actually uh, live in. <laughs> well, this has been spectacular. We're, we're out of time right now. Uh, but uh, Vernon said that he would sign some books. That, I mean, I, I'm not <laughs> trying to commit you to too many, sure, but, yeah, but he said yeah. he would sign books if people want uh, their books signed. And uh, I'm really, it's been an honor to be able to talk to you today, Vernon, and to have you here at, at North Dakota State University. Uh, we're, it's just great that you came here. I really appreciate it. So let's all give a round of applause. Thank you, John.